This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Thank you, Sitinner. OK. Is my mic working? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'd like to speak, as Sitinner mentioned. Sitinner pretty much covered it. Did anyone have any questions? OK. I've got a little more detail to share with you than that. So if you haven't been to our campus, uh, hopefully you were all there last year for the, the sustainability conference. Uh, Cal Poly is an old campus, founded in 1901. We have a very wide variety of mechanical systems. I like to say that some of them are still made out of wood. Um, we started a massive uh, long-term commitment to conversion in modern technology and DDC control starting in 1984, and that's still underway. Uh, many of our older buildings still use constant volume air handling systems. Uh, most of those have received DDC controls at the equipment level, but not down to the zone level, and that's kind of where we're working forward with our retrofits in the future. Uh, newer buildings, 1990 and newer, are typically VAV with full DDC control down to the zone level. Um, DDC retrofits are, are typically expensive, as we all know, in facilities. Uh, building automation controls are not inexpensive. Typical rule of thumb is somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000, $1,500 per point uh, can be higher than that. <coughs> we demonstrated four different uh, projects of two different technologies uh, for the conference that we hosted last year. As Sustainer mentioned, the DART system and the uh, kitchen demand ventilation control system. And there were some partners I want to recognize in that and helping us make that happen. Obviously, the peer program, which runs these technology demonstrations and helped to fund them. Uh, Federspiel Controls, which is the designer and uh, maker of the DART system that we implemented. Architectural Energy Corporation, which did um, much of the project management, uh, acted as the general contractor, did all the M&V. Melink, which is the maker of the demand ventilation control system we'll talk about later. Uh, Culinary Systems is their rep, uh, seller, installer. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the incentive funds provided by our partnership program and uh, a, a unique rebate program which is no longer available, the CVRP, Constant Volume Retrofit Program. Uh, we had enough dollars to implement these uh, projects 100% uh, funded with no co-funding by the campus. So for constant volume to VAV retrofits, as we're all still dealing with on our older buildings, you have a, a problem to solve with a number of needs. You're trying to find a cost-effective way to convert these older buildings to, to variable volume technology. You want to try to integrate them into your existing campus backbone. Uh, our campus uses a Siemens uh, Apogee building automation system. And of course, you, you want to preserve occupant comfort and minimum ventilation rates when converting older systems to variable volume technology. Uh, whenever you need to retrofit a building to get from room to room to room to, to, to uh, retrofit, mixing boxes or VAV boxes. There's a lot of penetrations to building structures, a lot of work up in plenum spaces where you can have hazardous materials, building insulation, pipe insulation, uh, lead paint. Those, those are costs that can blow any project out of the water, so you're looking for ways to minimize those costs. The solution we implemented for this uh, demonstration was the DART, or Discharge Air Regulation Technique. I'll explain how that works in a minute. And this was implemented using the Federspiel Advanced Control System which relies on wireless mesh technology. So what is DART? How does DART work? Uh, the discharge air regulation technique is a control uh, algorithm that basically, in a, in a nutshell, looks at your zone temperatures for all the zones and the individual rooms that are controlled off a particular unit and compares those temperatures to an allowable range or dead band. In this case, typically, we'd look at the Executive Order 987 mandates of 68 degrees for heating and 78 degrees for cooling. If all the zones are within that allowable range, you ramp your fans down to minimum speed, typically 50%. If there are zones outside the range, you increase the fan volume to make sure you're delivering adequate heating and cooling. Uh, typically, you don't want to control off the worst zone if something's not working well or if you have a problem area with a, a concentrated heating or cooling load. You can have the tail wagging the dog or 
a single room wagging the entire building. So you typically control off the second or third worst zone. When uh, the fan speeds are down at minimum, we implemented a reset strategy on our economizers that bring in fresh outside air so that as we slowed the fan down, we brought in uh, a larger percentage of outside air to make sure we met our minimum ash ray ventilation rates. So obviously, such a project requires VFDs on your fans. Uh, if, if they're not in place, they would need to be installed. And uh, the DART system, I want to make sure it's clear, does not actually take over control of your zone temperatures. Your existing zone uh, temperature controls would still be in place and still be in use. So the three buildings in which we did this, we had pneumatic zone controls. Those are still used to operate the local devices. The Federspiel system installs a wireless temperature transmitter, battery powered, uh, in all the zones that you want to monitor. In the mechanical room, you install a new control cabinet, which has a, a microprocessor controller that's running the DART algorithm. It has uh, uh, an Ethernet hub to be able to collect all the wireless data and transmit wireless data to output devices. And that's really as simple as it is. This is an example of one of the room temperature sensors, immediately beneath one of our probably circa 1990 pneumatic thermostats. Uh, this would be the main existing control panel in the fan room, the Siemens control panel, um, with a Federspiel wireless uh, output module. So in this case, the Federspiel controller can send out an output signal for the fan speed, which is picked up by this receiver, uh, connected into the Siemens system, and then can control the drives through that. Um, in the absence of a building automation system, you can control the devices directly from the Federspiel. We tried to integrate it into our system so they would work together. The wireless mesh network is really the most interesting part of this technology. Uh, on all the hardware that Federspiel uses is really off the shelf. Nothing is proprietary. They don't manufacture any of this stuff. They've, they've uh, developed this technology using off the shelf IT stuff. Makes it quite cost effective and very robust. So the wireless mesh network, uh, the advantage is all your devices are surface mounted. You don't have to drill any holes in the building. Don't need to cut through any walls. Minimal electrical work, minimal wiring and conduit required. Uh, no penetration disturbance of hazardous materials other than uh, a few screw holes, uh, which we had to, our protocol on our campus is to clean those with a wet rag. Makes it easy. It's pretty simple hazmat abatement. Uh, the wireless mesh network is self-healing, so there are multiple paths from any device back to the receiver, the hub. And this is a, a diagram, whoops, sorry. This diagram is showing uh, all the devices in the field. These are room temperature sensors. And you would have uh, a controller back, actually this is probably the controller, um, multiple paths to get data back to the central controller. If any one of them fails, it'll, it'll detect another path and use the most efficient path. Uh, they use uh, frequency hopping technology, so it's, it's operating in the uh, 900 megahertz bandwidth, will not interfere with any of your Wi-Fi systems. Your IT people should be okay with this. Um, and it uses that technology to maximize battery life. So it looks at the traffic through any particular path, and if it sees a particular device carrying too much of the load, it'll use another path to share the battery life and make them last somewhere between four and eight years. And again, as far as integration and interoperability goes, uh, the Federspiel controllers have a, a large number of uh, open protocols they're able to use. So we implemented the DART system in three different buildings. Our uh, College of Science and Math, Education Building, and the Health Center. Uh, these were all constant volume systems. We had a, a double duct, excuse me, a double duct, uh, constant air volume. Heating only, education is the same, and the health center was a single duct, uh, constant air volume with terminal reheat, heating and cooling, so a little bit different system. The results were quite uh, pleasing. We reduced fan energy by, between the three systems, an average of about 60%. Reduced heating energy uh, by about 27% average on all three systems, just by the reduction of outside air use. We literally had no hot and cold complaints from the spaces served by these, which I was really expecting, and no air quality complaints. So I was quite pleased with the performance. The implementation cost was in the neighborhood of $60,000. That's well less than half of a typical DDC conversion of those spaces at the zone level. 
energy savings in the neighborhood of $15,000 a year and a payback after incentives of less than three years. So a couple of graphics here. This is a good demonstration of what the DART system does throughout the day. So you're looking at trends from about half a dozen different days laid on top of each other. And you can see the fan volume goes to 100% in the morning warm-up period. And as soon as you get all the zone temperatures within the band, the fan backs off to minimum speed and your fan energy drops dramatically. And of course, if you're familiar with uh, the properties of variable frequency drives, when you cut the fan speed in half, you cut the fan energy by 7 eighths. You go down to 1 eighth of the power because it's a cube function. And then again, later in the day, in the afternoon, uh, this is probably one of the systems that has uh, cooling. The sun comes out, it gets hot in the afternoon, the rooms get above the top of the dead band, and the fan volume ramps up to address the cooling needs. From a daily profile to a, a total energy consumption, this is showing you before and after. This is a typical, you can see uh, there's a six-day cycle here, so this is a building that's running six days a week. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six days, and then a weekend. This is before retrofit, uh, kilowatt hour consumption, drop down to post retrofit. So there's a, a few spikes where the weather conditions required the system to deliver more air, but you spend a huge amount of your time uh, running at low load and part load. So lessons learned. Um, as, a, as a former building mechanic, I know this top lesson from experience. Um, have gotten away with it many times. You can put VFDs on a lot of motors that are not inverter duty rated, but it's a good idea. Put new motors on. If you're going to retrofit an old system, the motor's a couple hundred bucks. Uh, Labor is going to be a few hundred bucks. Put some nice fresh inverter duty motors rated on there. Uh, we had, we did that on every building except for one, and of course on that one building, the old motor failed within a matter of days once it was put on uh, the VFD. Another interesting lesson, a lot of old building systems do not have dedicated grounding from your equipment back to your electrical equipment room. They rely on the conduit system for grounding, so check that before you commit to a scope of work and send a contractor out there to install this. The VFD manufacturers are going to require that you ground those systems. You may need to do some electrical work to provide a ground path. Uh, consider the options. Talk to your building operators, your controls folks in-house about how they would like to see such a system integrated into your existing DDC system. There's a lot of options to do that. Obviously involve those same folks in uh, obviously, in installation, startup, and commissioning, but, but even better, planning. Get them involved early so they can buy into the project. Uh, in a comparison between the Federspiel wireless system and a typical full-blown DDC conversion, my, my feeling, based on the, the information we got from our m and is that you're going to accomplish somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of the total energy savings. Since you don't get new zone controls, you're gaining all this, the energy savings at the air handler. So you don't gain the full benefit of a full DDC conversion, but probably 80% of it for well less than half the cost. OK, second technology we demonstrated was the kitchen demand ventilation control system. We retrofitted our main uh, central dining, uh, main kitchen hood, which has uh, three exhaust fans, three horsepower each. And if you've ever been in the kitchen early in the morning, the first thing the cooks do when they walk in is turn all the equipment on and then go take a break and start planning their day. So those fans run from the morning the doors open, the, the time the doors open in the morning, until the end of the night when they close. And they run at full speed, exhausting a large volume of conditioned air that you just spend a lot of money to treat and get down to temperature. So uh, in comparison, their cooking activities are intermittent and cyclical. There's a breakfast rush. There's a lunch rush. There's a dinner rush. Um, those, the cooking facilities, there's a lot of prep work going on, but they, much like other mechanical systems, spend a large portion of their day with nothing going on. There's no reason to run those fans at full speed. So uh, this is a great application of demand ventilation control technology, and a, and a simple one at that. So the solution is slow the fans down when they're not cooking. How can you tell when they're cooking? Well, the MeLink system is quite simple. It uses a light beam shot across, excuse me, shot across a set of transmitters that are mounted right on the bottom of the hood. So you shoot a light beam across the hood. That light beam will be interfered with by steam or smoke. In addition, you locate a temperature sensor up in the exhaust duct going up to the fan. You monitor those two inputs and decide what the VFDs need to do. So we installed VFDs on the three fans. Here they are, using our, our campus standard of an ABB drive. And uh, you monitor those systems. And if there's no cooking going on, if the exhaust air is not hot and you can't see smoke or steam, 
you run the fans down to minimum speed, and again, that's typically about 50%. If you detect a temperature rise in the exhaust, you ramp up the fans to maintain a certain maximum temperature, and if you see smoke or steam, you send them to full speed automatically. And the system works uh, quite simply. Again, we're very pleased with the performance of this system. We reduced the fan energy by 54%, and by eliminating the amount of conditioned air exhausted out of the building, we reduced our heating energy by 34%. The cost of this project was a little over $50,000, which included uh, we replaced all three exhaust fans in advance, so we had new equipment. You know, kitchen, ex kitchen equipment gets beat up pretty bad. Um, the energy savings is almost $10,000 a year, approximately a four-year payback after incentives. And again, this graphic from our, our monitoring shows, uh, excuse me, a before condition of full speed operation whenever the system is on, and afterwards, lots of downtime. Lots of downtime. So you can see the cycles of when cooking's going on and then hours of the day when it's not. So we spend a significant amount of time down at minimum speed. Again, lessons learned. You want to involve not only your maintenance folks, but now the kitchen staff, because their world is going to be different. So you have to educate cooks, prep cooks, uh, the dining maintenance people who are typically not building system experts. They're kitchen equipment experts about how the system works and how, what they need to be able to pay attention to to notice if things are working or not working. Um, need to be careful to integrate these systems properly with your fire suppression system. So typically, the, if you have a fire system trip, uh, you'll want these to go to uh, full speed. And again, this control system is capable of entering full, full standalone functionality, but it's advantageous to integrate it into your DDC system so you can monitor it remotely and pick up alarms. And here are contacts for myself and all the folks involved in the project. So did you want to do a quick Q&A, Satinder? Yes. Any, any questions? So the question is, are we considering expanding the use of the Federspiel controls? Um, yes, we are. Um, in talking to, to Cliff Federspiel, the uh, principal of the company, they're considering working on a, a next generation of this product that actually would be able to do zone temperature control. So it would be a very cost-effective alternative to VAV retrofits of our existing buildings into our automation system. So yes, we would be considering that. Question over here? So the question is, how do we maintain the minimum airflow requirements for a space, ventilation requirements, for instance, for a laboratory? We didn't use the system in any, any lab buildings. This was uh, two classroom buildings and a health center. Uh, but basically, you, you accomplish minimum air volumes by air balance. So you manually go around with a flow hood, measure the air volume coming out of the registers in all the rooms, run the fan down to minimum speed or whatever your minimum speed is going to be, and ensure, uh, check what the, what the rates would be. And as I mentioned, uh, we programmed our economizers to run at a higher percentage outside air or even full outside air to make sure that we were meeting the ventilation requirements. And of course, you have to understand the difference between the volume of air delivered and how much of that air is fresh air. When we say ventilation requirement, we're referring to how much fresh air is required for a space, typically uh, dumb, controlled by the occupancy, how many people are in the space. Yes, question back here? Well, constant air volume systems, typically that's not, not a, a factor. Uh, you look at pressure, pressure dependent and pressure independent when you talk about variable air volume, where you're measuring volume and controlling volume to the zones. In a constant volume system, uh, that's a static system with, with volume dampers that are balanced one time, and you deliver the same volume of air all the time. So there's no, there's no, uh, no analog when, when you talk about a variable volume system like that. that control to the zone area, the CFMs, basically as you slow down, 
basically uh, the funds. You don't know exactly how much CFM is going to get to each spaces. That's, that's correct, and that's one of the disadvantages uh, from doing full-blown DDC control down to the zone level where you're actually measuring volumes. Uh, but that's a costly retrofit. That's why this is an option to that. So you, you address that essentially manually with air balance. Yes? Talk a little bit more about the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis of the, the mesh network versus the hard wiring solution. For, for your DDC control? Yeah, the mesh, the mesh network, of course, we didn't break out the cost of the mesh network separately from the project, but the, the mesh network uh, is really what makes this a cost-effective solution. When you have to uh, put control devices on every mixing box or VAV box in the building and network those all via hardwire back to your main controller, that's the, that's the most expensive part of a building VAV conversion. So we eliminate uh, the lion's share of the cost on that kind of, kind of project by using the wireless mesh. I think a lot of folks would like to know that. So if we can maybe re-engage Peer to do the cost-benefit yeah, analysis on that. that's a good idea. Yeah. Yes. You have to have the microphone, they're telling me. The temperature sensors you have installed in the grease duct, how often do you have to replace them? The temperature sensors? Right. Oh, on the, the mealing kitchen. system? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't been in long enough to know yet, but uh, they're, they're using sensors that are, that are stainless steel intended for kitchen application in a grease hood. So they should last a while, but uh, the campus dining folks, they have to clean those hoods anyway. So they have some, some poor little guy has to get up on a ladder, climb up inside that hood and clean all the grease just for fire safety from the entire inside of the hood and the exhaust duct. So when he does that, he cleans the sensors at the same time. Say, so Dennis, on your... Last question, Phil. On your, on your uh, mesh network, multi-floor applications, uh, is there any problems it with that? It absolutely can be multi-floor. Uh, you have to get a little creative with where you locate sensors. We put temperature sensors in about half of the zones we were monitoring, and we had to move some of those around to find the parts of the building, of a concrete building, where the signal would make it through floor as well. But it's very doable. Yeah, you can absolutely go through concrete walls. Last, last, the, the question after the last question from our representative from Federspiel Controls here, Jeff Spanbauer. My name is Jeff Roundhorst, and I'm with Federspiel Controls. So uh, South Hall here on campus has the Federspiel Control system in it, and it's a very heavy concrete building. And we put one receiver on either the top or bottom floor, and it can span six floors without a problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Uh, you know, in my dreams, this was a standing room only crowd. I uh, guess it didn't turn out that way, but I really appreciate I appreciate you showing up today. Um, my name is Patrick McGee. I'm speaking to you today representing the University of California, San Francisco. Um, you know, I've been really impressed with everything I've seen today, so um, I hope you find our presentation useful. Joining me today is Mike Sweeney from Arup, his associate principal. In a moment, he's going to come in and describe in depth the uh, Mount Zion retrofit project, um, all the detective work he performed up front to um, uh, identify just what the causes were of, of the major energy consumption in that building and uh, what our implementation measures were. and and what we ended up saving um, at the project's completion. Uh, I just want to spend a brief amount of time talking about UCSF and uh, what we've done in the last few years um, regarding energy efficiency projects. I think um, we're trying to assume a leadership role. And under the guidance of our interim assistant vice chancellor, Mike Bidet, our director of facilities management, Merrick Munn, and Suki Sandu, who used to be on the campus side, he's now director of um, engineering and utilities with UCSF Med Center. Suki actually brought me on board this project and assembled the team and really um, was the architect. Um, just within this past year alone, UCSF under the UC CSU IOU program has completed 12 energy efficiency projects. Um, 
and PG&E, our collaborative partner, has, has just been great every step of the way. Um, the total savings from the 12 projects are 696 kW, 6,121,860 kWh, and 506,534 therms, 6,325 tons of CO2. The total amount that we received from PG&E to um, perform these projects was $1,966,201. And here we are with a big check. This is two weeks ago. Um, of the projects, of the 12, um, we feel that the UCSF Mount Zion retro Retrofit Project is an excellent example of how energy savings may be identified and achieved through retrofit and monitoring-based commissioning. Uh, I'm now going to turn this over to Mike Sweeney, who will describe you how the project was conceived and implemented. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, again, I'm Mike Sweeney. I'm with Arup, and we helped uh, UCSF implement this project. And as Patrick mentioned, this is really the, the foresight of Suki Sandu, who, who was the UCSF Director of Engineering, and he's now with the Medical Center side of the university. Uh, but the project got started uh, a year after Suki and our firm won the uh, Best Practice Award for a monitoring-based commissioning project at Rock Hall. And when Suki called me up, uh, one of the stipulations to the proposal I had to send him was that this project was going to have to win a best practice award also to follow in that one's footsteps. So luckily, we made it to the stage here, uh, but definitely through the, through the hard efforts of Patrick and uh, Suki. So it was a lot to live up to. Uh, the way this project started was, uh, as you can see in red, after uh, Rock Hall was renovated, Mount Zion then stood out as a sore thumb in terms of energy consumption. It was it's really the energy hog of the pack of the UCSF uh, facility fleet. So it was an obvious uh, candidate for, for finding some energy savings. Uh, the building itself is a four-story laboratory building. There's uh, some pretty intensive cancer research going on in the building, so something we were very leery of and didn't, didn't want to disrupt because uh, very important things are going on in this building. Uh, it's effectively two, two stacks of uh, four-story buildings with an open-air atrium in the middle, 109,000 square foot. It was built in 1997, and the, the annual uh, electric consumption was 5.4 million kilowatt hours per year, about uh, 50 kilowatt hours per gross square foot, which is about five times greater than you would expect from a, a normal office building, so pretty, pretty intensive energy consumption. Uh, we got started on the project in October of 2006, and the first thing we did was come in and take a look at the systems, uh, mainly on the HVAC side, and uh, to live up to Suki's big expectations, we're going to you know, go in and find where we could uh, remove all of this energy consumption. Well, first thing I found was that it was really a pretty simple system for this laboratory. It just br brought in 100% outside air. Uh, heated and cooled that air to 58 degrees and then sent it to all of the zones, all the labs. And uh, then each zone had its own reheat coil that heated the air back up to make the occupants comfortable. So there wasn't a lot of bells and whistles to mess with. It was a very basic system. And we kind of scratched our heads and thought, okay, <laughs> what are we going to do here? We've got to live up to these, these high expectations. Um, so what we did was we gathered a lot of information through trending and we started to look at how the building was operating, and we found a couple of interesting things. The first was that the discharge static pressure out of the air handlers was about 2.4 inches. Now, given that there's no variable boxes or constant volume boxes, it basically just blowing air through ductwork, through reheat coil, and then out into the zones, that was a pretty high amount of static pressure. So that, that kind of signalness that something was going on with that. We would have expected to see maybe an inch, inch and a half at most. Uh, the next thing we saw in looking at the trending data was that there was a significant amount of reheat being used in the building all throughout the year. Um, and as you see, the zones in red were basically the reheat coils were on all the time throughout the year. Typically, the, the valves were 50% open or greater. Um, the zones in blue, a few of them, those are the zones that were satisfied with no reheat. 
And then the, uh, the lone zone in yellow was where they had stuck a bunch of uh, negative 83 degree freezers and, and they were rejecting all this heat into the room and, and the air conditioning load couldn't keep up with that condenser heat. And so that was the lone zone that was uh, not happy, didn't have enough air conditioning. And it, it was starting, to, it was kind of driving the whole uh, reset schedule for the, for the building. So once we looked at this trend data from the building automation system, we started to have a good idea of, okay, here are some areas where we really need to attack. Now it's just figuring out how we can do that. So the next step in our process was to put together a, a, a monitoring plan or a test plan. And we uh, I applaud UCSF in that they're a very uh, great customer to work with and that they helped us out by bringing in a test and balance company to go out and actually take a look at what's going on in the system, get some measurements with hoods, uh, amp meters, get those implemented, and, and let's find out what's going on with the building. So we put together this test plan, and we went out and walked the building with the test and balance company, and we gathered quite a bit of data. And one of the key results that came out of that was we found that uh, there was a main branch damper on, on each of the floors, and all of those dampers were pretty much pinched way back. They were basically choking all the air off to the building. And that's why we ended up with the, the high static pressure coming out of the fans, because it had to overcome all this pressure from, from, this, uh, from the balance dampers or the branch dampers. And the same thing was happening on a zone-by-zone -zone basis. So when they balanced this building, they essentially put the fans on full speed and, and then just started uh, choking off air as they saw fit to make it work. So we knew there was a significant opportunity to rebalance this building. Um, the next thing we found, by doing a little bit of investigative work, and by uh, taking the measurements from the uh, test and balance company was that the laboratories were uh, being supplied about 24 air changes of air per hour. So significant volume of air going into each of the laboratories. Um, the, the university's uh, health standards were that it would maintain an eight air change rate, air per hour rate. Um, so what we did was we, we took a look, we did some modeling of the loads in the building and found that on the south facing uh, laboratories, we could get away with about 15 air changes per hour peak, reduced down from 24. And then on the, on the north facing, we could get away with about 12 air changes per hour peak. And at nighttime, we, would, we decided we could take the air changes down to eight, again, at the uh, health, health uh, health requirement for the, for the lab by the university standards. So what we did was we, imp we came up with a plan to implement uh, variable speed drives on the fans and to reduce airflow in the uh, south facing zones to 15 air changes per hour in the day and, and then ramp that down to eight air changes per hour at night and then let that vary in between those periods when we didn't have a peak load. And then similarly on the, south, on the north facing facades, uh, we took it down to 12 and eight. And as a result, we ended up implementing, uh, installing variable speed drives uh, with some harmonic filters. We were worried about the sensitive nature of the uh, test equipment in the laboratories. We wanted to make sure there was no transient harmonics that got out into the system. Uh, we modified the sequence of operations to make all of this happen. And then we put in a lot of uh, monitoring systems to make sure that we were maintaining safe airflow rates. Uh, that we were watching what the building was doing from an energy standpoint over time so that we could maintain uh, some persistence in the energy savings. And what we ended up was with the following results. You see in, in orange the, uh, the baseline year, uh, PG&E's 15-minute data, and then the project. It was, it was implemented in August, but it was finally commissioned in, uh, over Halloween of last year. And that's where you see the blue line start to diverge from the baseline. Yeah, so that's the electrical savings. Uh, from a gas standpoint, I'm showing a little bit of a different trend here. This is uh, before and after. This is the boiler energy consumption versus outside air temperature. And you can see in orange how the uh, profile looked beforehand. And now in, uh, in green, we see how we're, we're doing currently. As a result, uh, electric consumption reduced to 3.4 million kilowatt hours, 35, 36% energy savings. Therms reduced down to 267,000, 100,000 therm savings, 27% of the gas. Overall, it was a 35% reduction in total energy. From a dollar standpoint, we were able to avoid $343,000 in annual cost. 
uh, the project cost was itself was 709,000, of which the uh, partnership kicked in $504,000. Very generous check, part of that $1.9 million check Patrick just showed us. And so the uh, net simple payback to the university was 0.6 years. So it turned out to be an excellent project. And with that, I guess we'll take questions. Yeah, the question is, what's, what was the, was the energy management system? It was the uh, Johnson Controls Medicine system, uh, original. Yeah, we were able to, what we did was we selected a few reheat coils to keep an eye on, mostly on the second floor, which was, what the, which was the picture that I showed. And we just mod watched those over time to see what they did. Yeah, it, it was all the time, <laughs> and, never, and it's a 24 by 7 building, 100% outside air all the time. So it was really just a function of uh, what the outside air temperature was in terms of how much gas and how much reheat or how much preheat they were using. Yeah, part of the project implementation was a full rebalance of the system, uh, going through every diffuser, rebalancing it, shifting air from areas that were overcooled to areas where we needed some cooling, the few areas that were like that and reducing the static pressure in the main supply duct work, uh, which we got down to about an inch. So we... Right, right. Well, we, we put together a bid package, and Johnson Controls was the successful bidder. And so Johnson implemented the controls sequence of operations changes that we, that we wanted. And they also were the turnkey contractor and implement the VFDs and put in the monitoring. We put in flow meters on chilled water, hot water, steam, uh, as well as airflow. Yeah, this is Bill. Sorry, I'd like to make a comment and then a question. Um, the, the Texas Lone Star program discovered that their university laboratories were their biggest commissioning opportunity. Those were constant volume reheat systems. This isn't something new. And in fact, their average savings was like 38%, not on a system basis, on a total building energy use basis during that commissioning process. So I'd suggest that any campus that has constant volume reheat laboratories should, you know, this should be like a no-brainer. I mean, we should just be signing a contract with, with a, you know, an MBX commissioning agent to go do it because it's such it's such a good deal. But now the question, uh, that was the advertisement. The, the question is, uh, uh, what is the university's argument as to when is eight or 10 air changes, what scenario is, is it under which eight or 10 air changes are safe and six air changes is unsafe? Well, you'd have to ask the university that. Their, <laughs> their policy was actually one CFM per square foot which worked out to eight air changes per hour in this lab based on the ceiling height. And, and that was the documentation we were giving that we ne given that we needed to follow during the design phase. Well, well, one CFM per square foot actually isn't an air change rate. That's the proper uh, uh, metric. If you said six air changes, then that depends on how high the ceiling is. But one CFM per square foot, it doesn't matter how high the ceiling is, it's still one CFM per square foot. So right, if, right. That's their, if that's their requirement, that, that's six air changes with a 10-foot ceiling, so that would be great. Yeah, and I was giving the requirement air changes per hour just to keep consistent units in terms of the presentation, but uh, because what we found was a 24 air change per hour rate initially. Did you install terminal VAV boxes? No, that was, uh, I I'll, obviously it would have been ideal. I saw a presentation earlier where we were looking at uh, installing VAV boxes in a hospital or laboratory situation, but given the existing conditions of this building, that would have been very expensive. Maybe the next step would have been to use the, the DART system that Dennis was describing. I mean, it was a very similar project or similar problem that we were tackling between the two projects. It's just ours was a lab building and Dennis's were more classroom ut utilization. Uh, the DART system would have added additional cost over what, what we ended up um, providing in our implementation, but 
there's obviously different steps uh, to which you can do these projects. And, and actually, one of the first, uh, the lowest cost option we looked at, which would have come in even cheaper, was just to simply reshiv the fans to, to match the flow rates and, and possibly even go to a two-speed motor to try to get us between the daytime and nighttime operation scenarios. But the university and myself, we felt much more comfortable going to the variable speed drive solution. What did you do about the room full of freezers or whatever? I take it it's not still driving the supplier temperature? Right. So we, we were able to take a lot of the excess air flow and move it into the room where the freezers were so we could take care of that load. And also in the sequence of operations that we implemented, we, we made sure that that particular zone wasn't able to drive the reset schedules. So, so this is a whole building night setback solution then? There's no individual setback solutions for each one of the zones? Right. Unfortunately, as Don was asking, did you put in VAV boxes? Because there, there was nothing to control air to individual zones. So we just had to ramp up and down the airflow in, in a whole building. So is, is there a future planning solution to, to solve that issue? I mean, um, going down to six air changes is a huge step. There are some conference rooms on the west side that are floor to ceiling glass, and these are tall, these are 15 foot tall spaces. And so, one of our, in our final report, we did recommend putting in uh, VAV boxes specific to those conference zones, being that they're less, uh, they're, they're not lab functions, and they have, qu they have just a very uh, uh, few times when they peak, obviously, when the sun's in the west. So, so hopefully, we'll be implementing some VAV on part of the building in the future. wasn't a constraint since their minimum six air changes was greater than the pressurization needs of the building? Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's a, that? that's a great point. The, uh, the pressurization requirements on the far right, it was around four air changes per hour. Um, and as you see in the floor plan, the, the two yellow boxes, it was a large, la most of the laboratories were large, about 1,800 square foot with only two 600 CFM hoods. So there wasn't a lot of need for uh, um, exhaust and pressurization makeup. Thank you. Very nice. My name is Mike Miller. I'm the Director of Facilities Planning and Management. And I'm just tickled pink to be in a room full of people that think mechanical engineering is sexy. I think it's very cool. Um, I'm here just to introduce our project a little bit. Uh, Butte College is about, uh, we're about 500 miles north up the valley over on the east side. And we get a little snow once every 10 years, but we get a lot of freezing. And then every year we get 30 to 40 degrees of 110 degree air, daytime temps at about five to 8% humidity. So we have this really interesting climate. Um, we're a, uh, Oh, that's the public service announcement. Um, we're a dedicated, uh, designated wildlife refuge, and we just celebrated our 41st year. So we have about 1,000 acres of foothills, uh, 200 acres of developed campus, um, large number of rattlesnakes, although this year the number's down. I think we're at 16 or so for this year. Um, and many different uh, habitat types. So we have riparian and grassland and woodland and wetlands on campus. And in the last uh, eight years, we've been going through a building expansion with the local bond and state funding. And about five years ago, we were between buildings one and two, and we started our planning on our arts building. So we've had a strong dedication to sustainability. And just last May, we had a ribbon cutting on our fifth array of solar. So. Currently, we're 43% solar powered on campus, which is pretty neat. Um, the last uh, five or six years, if you're a facilities guy responsible for a local bond uh, and state funding, uh, you've seen cost escalation just go through the roof. Uh, we saw cost increases about 70% construction costs from 2002 to 2006. Four years ago, we penciled arts that we thought we had about 18 million to build it. And uh, three years ago, we had a cost estimate of 25 million, 24 and a half. 
After that, it was 26 million, I think, was the high point. And every time we brought our consultants together, we had these meetings, and you know, we only have a certain amount of money to spend on the project, uh, but we want top flight HVAC, okay? We want the best HVAC. And a couple of years ago, before we started the project, we thought we would be close and had enough money for it, and we decided that, well, we were gonna go LEED certified, just certified level. And all the consultants, most of the consultants, especially those architects, were going, oh, LEED silver, LEED gold, LEED platinum, it's only money. And we were going, no, LEED certified, certified level. So we made that commitment, and we started running our numbers. And what we found is that we set standards back in 2002 on energy efficiency. Minimum new construction, minimum 15% better than Title 24. And we ran our lead numbers pre-construction and we were coming up high silver and gold because we were already doing smart things in the building. So that was very satisfying for us. So the Arts Building is our biggest building on campus, 77,000 square feet. Um, has a performance space, has acting lab, green room, dressing room, costume shop, and also has all of the fine arts programs. So um, they are somewhat akin to your physical sciences building or your life science building as far as chemistry. So we have uh, over 41 specialized spaces and many spaces in painting, drawing, ceramics, jewelry, photography with the wet lab, multigraphics, they all use a lot of chemicals. We need specialized HVAC, um, and we have it. We have over 41 specifically designed classrooms and labs in this building, and it's a gorgeous building. So um, basically, I came up here to brag about Butte College a little bit, but introduce Brian Provincial, who is the president of Turley and Associates and the best mechanical engineer one could hope to work with. So Brian, this is for you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure being here and working with Mike. Uh, our firm's worked with Mike over the last probably 10 years on every building out there from the major construction to multi-zone replacements on a variety of buildings. Uh, we've always been uh, very, very energy challenged out there. We've always pushed the envelope for every one of his buildings and uh, I think we've achieved success. Kind of an overview of the building. Uh, we have photo labs, you have administration, theater, theater program, music program, art program, just a variety of functions, as Mike was saying, in the building, 41 different, different classrooms and spaces that all require a specialized HVAC system. Sustainable features of the building. We're 35% lower than the standard for Title 24 for the baseline Title 24 for this building. Baseline electric use, 687,000 kilowatt hours. Our design electric use is 445,000 kilowatt hours. Lighting savings, we're down to 0.774 watts per square foot, incorporating high efficiency balance and daylight throughout the, throughout the structure. Sustainable features for the mechanical system. Like I said, we've got uh, 40 some odd different types of classrooms. Some of these areas require 100% outside air. We're really challenged in that climate using a 105 degree design dry bulb temperature and 67 wet bulb on a good day. In many, many cases, it gets up to 115 degrees in that climate. We incorporated a pre-manufactured chilled water plant that also incorporated high efficiency boilers and high efficiency chillers with evap condensing. We're, we're achieving a 15 EER on our system, on our, on our cooling side right now. All the system is primary, secondary pumping, VFDs on all the secondary systems, two-way valves throughout the building with a couple three-way valves for minimum VFD speed. We have six s separate air handlers, and three of those air handlers are a dual tunnel type air handler that are 100% outside air. What those units do primarily is we're pre-cooling the outside air using the exhaust with a heat pipe. The exhaust air is a, a direct spray before it hits the heat pipe. The other side of the heat pipe is 
is cooling down the outside air is the first stage. The second stage of that is indirect evap cooling. The third stage is direct evap cooling, and then we're polishing it off with a chilled water coil. You can see a baseline conventional load if we had 15,000, 16,000 CFM of conventional outside air, cooling that from 105 down to 55 degrees versus our design load of 413 incorporating our indirect direct evap cooling. As stated, we have the prefabricated central plant. Everything is, is shipped, completed. It's located in the back of the building. We chose to use that method primarily from quality of construction, uh, ease of installation from the first cost, and not giving up any real estate because we're a very, very tight space up there. Other items that we've incorporated in the building are room lighting, uh, VAV boxes and room thermostats are all tied into our occupancy sensors. In conjunction with that, all of the VAV boxes are programmed with a pre-schedule based upon the school schedule so that any of the rooms that are not occupied are, are driven down to a minimum set point. Our solar array for this project, we're offsetting 17% of the energy usage by incorporating more panels on the solar farm out there. Uh, we're incorporating waterless urinals, 100% outside air HVAC units, uh, energy me measuring and verification using EDEM, 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 EMON, DEMON system, excuse me, that was a tough one. We have electric vehicle fuel, fueling stations on campus and a sustainability wall, which is basically a teaching wall, which provides all of the features that we incorporate in the building for primary teaching. We're targeting lead gold for this building. We're about in the final phases. Uh, the building is being occupied actually this week. We should have notification of our lead certification. We built this building for $262 a square foot, which is, which is pretty tight for this type of building. Some of our features that I previously mentioned, sustainability wall, electric vehicle parking signs, waterless urinals, our Eamon Demon monitoring system, which will monitor all of our energy usage and substantiate everything that we've uh, designed, and our bicycle storage. Some of the, the during the project, the design phase, we, we used a, a, a BIM system to model everything in the building prior to construction. And as you can see with the stairs from the BIM model, on the left side, you see the actual model that we created for construction, and on the right side is the final construction of the stairway. This is the building incorporating all the mechanical systems throughout the building using the BIM system to identify any areas where we have obstructions with structure, electrical, piping. So once we finished this model and incorporated, it became the shop drawing for the mechanical contractor, provide a really nice ease of installation and coordination throughout the whole project. One of our other features, the whole project was run electronically. We didn't incorporate any, any hard copies of submittals or RFIs or any paperwork through the project. Everything was set electronically through all the design consultants and sent back to the architect or construction manager. So the amount of paper was reduced significantly on this project. Kind of a closing, that's the, uh, the contacts for the project. And that's our standard AIA documentation that we have to incorporate. Any questions? There, there we go. Now it's ready. Hi, um, I wanted to ask, I saw you were using, I think, both direct and indirect evaporative cooling on the facility. Um, did you get a sense from, or were you able to obtain from the um, provider, the vendor, what kind of water use is going to be required, not for the evaporation, but for the flushing of the tank for those, um, for those units? Because that's what we're concerned about. We're thinking about using them. We haven't, we haven't received that information. Actually, we requested that in the last couple of weeks, the actual amount, but we haven't received that back. Not the evaporation, but you're talking about the basin dump on a daily basis. Yeah, we haven't received that information yet. Do you have local chillers and boilers, or do you have a central plant there? We have the, the prefabricated central plant is what I was talking about. 
which incorporates the chillers, which are VAP condensing and the high efficiency boilers and primary secondary pumping. And that was just for this building then? That is just for this building. We don't have a central plant at that campus. Okay. And you mentioned that you have a, everything was done on BIM and uh, those BIM became the shop drawing for the contractor. That's correct. Now, um, uh, any liability issues? You're giving, handing them the shop drawings and if it doesn't fit? No, we, well, obviously we put a disclaimer on the, the whole package before we sent it to him, but uh, he, he used that primarily to develop his shop drawings with, with minimal modifications to those drawings. And, and, you know, we told him this is a model and you are required to produce your own shop drawings to validate any items. And that's how we approach that. And by the way, 35% uh, lower than Tile 24. That's very impressive. And that's 2005 Tile 24, right? That's correct. Very nice. Nicely done. Any other questions? Yes. We're hot water. Well, we, we tried the manufacturer that we're using. We had a tough time getting the highest efficiency boilers. There are condensing type boilers, but their actual uh, partial load efficiency, which we're listing, is 85%. So it's the partial load that we're looking for. You know, the, the full load is much higher than that, and we don't like to, to list a 90% full load because that's really not accurate for most of the time for a boiler. Thank you very much. I do have a question, though, from uh, Mike, Mike Sweeney, that Zion building, research building. You said uh, South Exposure was, sorry, South Exposure had 15 air changes and uh, North Exposure had 12 air changes. That it just, that was, that's the way it came out, but we, I mean, uh, outside environment has really no impact on the air changes per hour, is it? Uh, right, the, uh, that, was what we, that was what came out of the load modeling. So when we, we found that the air change rate in all of the labs was around 24, and then we said, well, what could we take this down to and maintain comfort? Obviously, we're gonna need to be above health and safety requirements and above the air change rates for pressurization. So we did some modeling in TRACE to identify what the load requirements were, and it turned out all the labs, again, had uh, floor-to-ceiling glass on either the north or south facade, depending which way they faced. Okay. So uh, obviously the north-facing labs needed less airflow to meet the, uh, the, the peak load in the summer. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you.